Ever since the anime, Sword Art Online was released back in 2012, many people around the world have been captivated by the idea of a simple, elegant virtual reality experience provided by the show's solution, the Nerve Gear. The Nerve Gear accomplished many things in one package, providing artificial sensory data, action intent redirection, and limiting of user physical motion all in one simple package. Indeed, without the virtual reality aspects the Nerve Gear provided, it's unlikely that many people would have been quite as excited to play a Sword Art Online on launch day as they were. In my last video on the Nerve Gear, I explained some of the problems with the design the Nerve Gear has in reality, and how they significantly hinder the prospects of developing the device by the show's specifications in reality. They're significant issues, and it's unlikely we'll be resolving them anytime soon without some Kayabaki Hiko appearing out of the blue and fixing them for us. So what can we do if we aren't in the mood to bet on a miracle? Stay tuned, and we'll be going over just that. I mentioned earlier, but the Nerve Gear accomplished three main things that were the key to its success and its appeal. The ability to render out sensory data directly to the brain, the redirection and interpretation of user movement intents, and the paralysis of the human body. The show accomplished these feats via the use of a brain-computer interface revolving around a microwave transceiver mechanism situated in the helmet enclosure. We don't have the technical know-how or understanding of physics to make such a mechanism work in real life, so we must find alternative solutions to accomplish all the functions listed, preferably in a compact and elegant package. Let's dissect the first function to understand what we have to do with it. Rendering data to the brain is really just a method of immersing your senses in virtual reality. That's a rather tall order, even if we go by the classical five senses of sight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste let alone the other 13 or so senses that are actually in the mix. Any one of these senses can screw up the virtual reality experience if they are improperly immersed. So how do we immerse ourselves? To start, we must first understand that immersion isn't necessarily about replacing reality or overloading it, but rather bending our perception of it. This can be accomplished in many ways, but the basic three methods are to supplant the census data with virtual data, such as in head-mounted displays and noise-canceling headphones, by overloading the sensory data with artificial data, thus making the body emphasize the artificial data over the real data, and the last method would be by negating it to the point where we don't even perceive it as reality to begin with. After all, you don't care much for visual immersion if you're blind now, do you? For all the types of immersion, we have three areas that we can target with some modicum of reasonability with our technology. These are the worldly stimuli that our body receives, such as the air movement around your skin, or the sense that in the air, or the light that you receive in your eyes. The nervous passages that our body uses to transmit data is the second area. This would include things such as your optic nerves, or your free nerve endings which deliver pain. And finally, we have the brain, which processes and interprets the stimulus data. The method you choose is up to you, but I'd say the worldly and nervous-based immersion are good places to look due to how much progress has been made in those areas, which things like HMDs, speakers, haptic technology, and nerve stimulation. These areas are also a lot less risky and complex to deal with than the brain, so if you're looking for faster return on your R&D, this is probably where you should look. Moving onwards, we have the subject of obtaining input data from the user. The Nerve Gear accomplished this by redirecting neural signals, but again, we don't exactly have this capability within our technological reach unless you count moving a nerve from one place to another and grafting it to a new place as a form of redirection of data. Overall, the task of getting inputs via neural data is a bit problematic as it depends on a lot of what the body's movement data even looks like and what we're even looking for. Are we looking for quaternion data on the rotational axis of limbs? Does the body generate spatial information on the limbs based on proprioception and have data translated by the spine for movement executions? Is this data in the form of muscle contractions and extension commands? Are they pre-computed in some capacity or are they generated in real time for every reasonable situation? Each one of these scenarios can mismatch the methods we use to even move the character models we have in software in the first place, and can make the development of rigs rather complicated and laborious depending on the final result. 
All of this points towards intent-based control systems being likely the most difficult and far-out solution that we can achieve, though it is but one of four systems for control that we can execute upon. I've classified the other three methods that I find might be a little bit more reasonable in the near term, via their typing and form. These are metaphorical systems, reality imitation systems, and finally inferred intent systems. Metaphorical systems are what you're most likely used to due to the fact they're basically everywhere at this stage. They're simple things such as buttons, touchscreens, mice, keyboards, and other such mechanisms. These items bear no realistic similarity to the actions being executed within the software, but they still manage to serve as inputs since their actuations, the pressing of buttons, dragging of mice, tilting of sticks, are translated to symbolize and perform different actions in software. The launching of a fist, movement, and shooting. This method is by far the least effective for actual immersion, since there's a constant layer of abstraction to the immersion, since the mind must actively suspend its disbelief to think its actions are truly indicative of the events it observes. If you're going to achieve virtual reality via this method, be aware that this is not an issue you can leave unattended. The next method, imitated reality, is reminiscent of metaphorical systems in that it revolves around using data from the impact of intents on designed mechanisms for data rather than the actual intents. But it's different in that it attempts to generate a one-to-one -one correlation between the actions the user's inputs generate and the inputs themselves. These would be your standard motion control systems like motion trackers and suits. They're better than metaphorical systems in terms of immersion due to the lack of the layer of abstraction, but they suffer from limiting factors of reality itself. The only actions the user can perform are the ones they can do in reality, and likewise, whatever actions they perform will have a direct impact on reality. Which brings in a significant safety problem, as it near inherently necessitates the actuation of the actions the user wishes to perform, which means the Nerve Gear's third aspect of negating motions is completely voided. I personally think these kinds of systems are more suited to augmented reality rather than virtual reality, but if you find a use for them, use them at your own discretion. The final alternatives I've found are inferred intent systems. These attempt to use the unintended byproducts of the generation and transmission of intent data to infer what the intents are, and in turn, use them for controls. The only two systems that I know of that are like this are electrogram based, and as a whole these systems have the benefit that they are not actually requiring the actuation of the user's intents to operate, and the potential benefit of negative latency since they can occur before the user would even expect them to happen in the first place. They wouldn't necessarily be limited to the user's actual motions, and can possibly operate while the user's actuation abilities are restricted. As you can imagine, I'm a fan of this model, and I'm pursuing its development personally, but there are problems with this system as well. The first and foremost is one of accuracy. Without direct control over the byproducts the data is obtained from, the data's consistency can be questionable, which renders the precision difficult to obtain. It's also debatable as to whether or not there would even be consistency in the first place, which could cripple any application in the consumer realm if a significant amount of calibration is required. Add in that the byproducts may be similarly complex to the intent data themselves, and the system becomes by far the next most difficult next to actually being able to comprehend the intents themselves and the processes that generate them. That just about does it more or less for the immersion in inputs. The last area of the Nerve Gear's main VR mechanism, the paralysis, is debatably even necessary as the user can restrict themselves via a variety of means, up to and including self-restraint. However, in the event that your system does require a means of paralysis, there are quite a few ways to do this. The first would be directly paralyzing the user via chemical agents, so the application of a safe, reusable, paralytic chemical will be required. Alternatively, Discouraging motion via the use of comforts, weights, and binds can work to numb the body movement in the first place. Finally, one could also investigate the artificial induction of a condition known as sleep paralysis, wherein the body's natural paralytic agent has yet to leave the system during the instance where the user is still aware, and thus, one would have access to the intent and inferred intent data without necessarily having the motions as a byproduct, though the amount of time this would last is known to be subject to research. Irregardless of what is done, however, if the intent is to make the device a consumer product in any capacity, user safety and legal viability are absolute imperative considerations that must be taken into account. A device with the specifications of the Nerd Gear from the program has already been taken off the market due to the danger of the battery system within its own canon, ignoring what was later found that the system could be used to manipulate memory of the users. 
These are not devices that should be allowed into the public realm under any circumstances, let alone on an online system. With intent and inferred intent systems, worries over things such as mind reading and privacy will undoubtedly surface, so expect public backlash in the event that such a system is found to be correlated to such practices. With direct sensory application via the brain or nervous outputs, worries over mind control may stifle development completely, let alone release, so expect a rigorous certification process before a consumer release will even be lined up, let alone approved for such a product. This is all without considering the risks of actual brain damage and psychological conditioning that can also lead to issues. So the takeaway I'd posit is undoubtedly that you must proceed with caution no matter which route, method, or system you choose to take. That just about does it for some of the basic principles you should keep in mind to create a Nerve Gear-like device in reality. Remember, these are just basic outlines and things to keep in mind, not direct instructions or the way you have to do it. If you're the real world equivalent to Kayaba, keep doing what you're doing. Just please don't get anyone hurt, violated, or killed, please. Well, that just about does it for this video, everyone. Do remember to rate, comment, share, and subscribe if you liked the video and haven't done so already. It really helps to support the channel. Please follow me on Twitter or on the Virtual Dreamers blog if you want to keep up to date with my latest endeavors, both of which are linked down below in the description. Thank you very much for watching this video. This has been Marcus Dahl, logging out.